Okay, so up top, if you've been following the channel for a while now, then you'll know that I don't intentionally rip into things for the sake of doing it. I'm not a get woke, go broke, anti SJW type YouTuber who just talks about things in a negative light to cause drama and get clicks. However, what Ezra Miller and CBS have done in general with the stand in this episode is so bad that it's bordering on offensive and I have no clue why they thought it was a good idea. Now, I'm not in the best of moods with CBS as it stands, pun not intended, as since starting my breakdowns, they put claims on a number of videos and had them blocked from being monetized. I do this as a full-time job and rely on the revenue that's brought forward from videos, so them carrying this out on something, especially when I wasn't even ripping into the show, it gets super frustrating. It kind of makes doing the videos a waste of time, as I could be working on something that's not going to get flagged and will get me money instead, but I know you guys are enjoying the videos, so I persevere. I've been trying to give these guys the benefit of the doubt, but clearly it's not happening from their side, so screw them at this point. After watching the opening of this episode, I've just had the little goodwill I had for this show killed completely. Now in the source material, the trash can man is a pyromaniac. He's fascinated with setting trash cans alight, hence the name, and though he suffers from a mental illness, I think even if you watch the original miniseries, then you'll know that he comes across more as a crazy person than someone who's disabled. Now, I don't know if I'm putting my own impressions and life experience before what the show is trying to portray here, but I did have a disabled relative who passed away last year, and the portrayal that Ezra gives seems like he's trying to ape that, but he isn't doing anyone any favours. In 2021, I just think this is such a bad take, and I have no idea why anyone allowed it to happen. When he's strutting slowly through the tankers with his jaw sticking out, bent wrists making velociraptor sounds, and then jacking off to fire, it just paints out people with disabilities in a very, very bad light. It's almost a caricature of someone suffering from something that they can't control, and it doesn't paint people out with disabilities in a sympathetic or understandable light. I'd heard for a while from people that had been given early access that Ezra went too far with his performance, and to go from him to then Tom Cullen being bossed about and tread on, it just seems such bad taste. They did a lot making Tom Cullen seem like more than his disability, but unfortunately they took 80 steps back to the 1970s and pretty much derailed the entire season with this opening. Whether this video gets blocked, hidden from view, I'm not really bothered, and I think that CBS should be very, very ashamed with themselves. Sorry, I had to get that off my chest. Now, as always, this is the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Paul. Welcome, I guess. Now let's get into the breakdown. Now, I'm, I'm actually interested to see if people agree with my rant or not, so hit the thumbs up button if you do, and down if you don't. Also, we've got just three episodes left of the season, so make sure you subscribe in order to not miss the breakdowns. Ter terrible opening, one of my worst ever, but one of the main reasons that I think this episode fails in its portrayal of the trash can man is because we get absolutely no idea who or what he really is. In the book, his backstory and journey to Vegas is far more fleshed out, and we see that he deals with paranoia from the electroshock therapy that he received as a child. However, there is a callback to him wetting the bed, and the line that people who play with fire do this appears in both this version and the miniseries. It just doesn't feel like it's developed enough though, and therefore he just comes across as a completely alien character that doesn't feel like he fits in with the rest of the cast. In the original work, he tries to sabotage a big part of the stronghold in Vegas, and he then goes and gets a nuke as a gift for Flag in order to repent. However, here he's definitely recruited, and this is the great fire that the antagonist is referring to. Now, in Boulder, Harold informs Nadine that Mother Abigail has disappeared, and he shows her the explosive that he's constructed. In the original work, it's hidden in a cupboard, whereas here it's placed into the top of the piano. Now, this does work slightly better, I think, as last episode, Abigail did show Nadine and audiences that she leaves the top open, and this is pretty much how Nick figures out that something is amiss. Now, this is rigged to go off during a vigil for Abigail, and this differs from the source material, as in that it was just at a committee meeting. I did think last week that the mention of the cinema night by Harold would mean that that would be the target for his and Nadine's schemes, but that's revealed as being more for the kids though I have no idea why they put so much focus on that at the expense of other things. Now one thing that is massively cut down is the arc that Judge Farris goes on. 
In the source material, there's a big shootout that happens as the character waits outside the town. Here, it's completely omitted from the episode, and the judge is killed off camera and then taken to Vegas. Flag wants her alive so that he can find out where Tom is, as due to his mental capacity, he's unable to unearth his location. All he's able to see is the moon, and Tom now interprets the run note as meaning the moon and thus makes plans to escape. In the book, the character just takes his bike and makes it out of Dodge silently, whereas here, he hides amongst the bodies in order to go out undetected. Now, one of the more interesting aspects of this episode is Nadine's arc. We hear Joe talk for the first time, and he very much divulges the dichotomy and duality that exists within her. She clearly can be kind and caring due to her being a teacher that looks after the kids. She even wants to stop Joe from going to the vigil, and also makes it so that Larry won't be near the explosion when it goes off. However, we also know that she's a killer who will gladly murder people en masse for Randall Flagg. Last week, we saw as Nadine went to Larry and clearly wanted to sleep with him, but here she ignores it and avoids discussing it with the character. Now, whereas she was once the driving force, between her and Harold, the roles are very much reversed here, with him being the one that wants to kill everyone. He comes to Mother Abigail's and heads out with Stu, and this gives Fran the chance to go into his house, which is where she makes a big discovery. Now, whereas the show has been cutting things down, in regards to Abigail, we get far more of a fleshed out story of when she wandered into the wilderness. Similar to Jesus who went into the desert, she's tempted by Flag, who promises to make her problems go away. He actually hints to how old he is after saying that he was present at a number of crucifixions and it becomes clear that he's been trying to take humanity over for a while. The thing with Flag is that he's had to wait until humanity was powerful enough to destroy itself and this of course came with the manufacture of Captain Trips. Now he's trying to sweep the survivors up and start again with them under his rule, but Abigail rejects his offer, saying that God will be able to find her no matter where Flag hides her away. There's also a moment in which he says he has many names, and is legion, for he is many. This quote comes directly from the Bible, namely the book of Mark, and it's what was given as a reply when Jesus asked a demon's name. He blows her with a huge gust of wind, and this could be a reference to the big bad wolf who metaphorically has appeared in a number of King's work. Abigail states that she knows Flag is afraid that people in Vegas will see him for what he really is, and this does start to happen in the episode when he brutally butchers the leader of a biker gang that was sent after Judge Farris. It's clear that people are deeply afraid of Flag, and though the City of Sin was initially labelled as heaven by Lloyd, the fact that you can get torn limb from limb for saying no shows that it's actually a tyrannical society. Flag is an almost all-seeing and all-knowing god that is ever-present, and him brutally beating the gang member for all to watch shows that he leads with fear rather than because people like him. He tears the guy, or rather the, fa the fake dummy, throw out, and is that not just the worst wig you've ever seen? I tell you what, CBS, you've really let us down. Go, go ahead, demonetize the video. After tearing his heart out, he overhears Julie talking about Mr. Moon, AKA the one thing that Flag sees when trying to look up who the spy is. However, it's too late and Tom makes his escape before he's caught. This failure in getting Dana to confess, capture Farris alive and take Tom in, shows that he isn't as powerful as he believes he is and it hints to us that, though godly, he's not unbeatable. Elsewhere, Harold and Stu go into the woods and the former almost does enough mice and men on the latter as he talks about his life. Stu seems genuinely to be suffering from survivor's guilt, and he doesn't really know what his place is, even though he was clearly chosen for a reason. He's saved by the head of the city watch, who states that due to Abigail's age, and being just in a nightgown, that it's unlikely she's still alive. Fran starts to explore Harold's basement, and here she discovers the surveillance equipment, as well as his manifesto. Though this scene wasn't in the original work, I think it's very akin to The Shining in which Wendy does the same thing. And that was actually made up for the movie, as is this moment for the show, but it's nice that the two are linked in some way. As we know from the first episode, Harold was obsessed with the fantasy that he would be the last man left alive with a woman and that the pair would fall in love. His story was rejected numerous times and he sees himself as being cheated out of having the life he always wanted. The incel side of him really rises to the top and even though Franny almost makes it through to him, he locks her in the basement. 
Now clearly this is to keep her out of harm's way and the same thing happens in regards to Nadine who makes it so that Larry is kept safe whilst things go down. Joe goes to the woods and here he finds Abigail. He alerts others by screaming and Fran escapes the basement and makes it to the vigil. Now it seems like she's done a lot of damage to her body and whether this causes a miscarriage or not, we don't know yet. In the book, this isn't really the way that things go down, so they could change it, but that remains to be seen for the moment. Now the people of Boulder pile into Abigail's house, but after she's found this stops, saving many of them from being inside when it blows up. Nick however isn't so lucky and after noticing that the piano lid is closed, he lifts it to discover the device inside which detonates not only killing him but also a lot of people surrounding the house. Harold and Nadine detonate it together and look over the carnage which is when we cut to the credits ending the episode. Anyway that wraps up the entry and obviously uh, lots to talk about and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and whether you agree with mine or not. Now don't forget that on the 30th of January we're giving away 3 copies of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings 4K box sets to our subscribers. All you have to do to be on with a chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. The links to our socials are in the description and you can also support the channel by clicking the join button and as a thank you you get videos like this early. If you want something else to watch then make sure you check out our do-overs of WandaVision or The Stand or you know anything in general that we've done on the channel. It's, it's all worth watching I promise and with that out of the way thank you for sticking through the video. I've been Paul and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.